Tonight we are doing a follow-up to last week's event, some company insight into Amazon's mock interview, or not mock interview, but their actual interview process. We're doing a mock right now. And today we obviously have Kevin, our one and only bar raiser, unless there's a mystery bar raiser among you. Um, for those of you who are unaware, the bar raiser uh, at a company like Amazon is essentially there to ensure that the quality of the interview process uh, is consistent from interview to interview, uh, from candidate to candidate, rather. And Kevin, of course, has gone into great detail uh, about this process uh, in his talk last week. So if you're interested in that and you're just you want to do that and you don't want to listen to, to us ramble about uh, the actual inter the mock interview today, feel free to go watch that. No hard feelings. Um, there's some great content and insight there. As for our purpose today, we have our special guest, the one and only Zach here in the chat. Hi. We have Zach here, I believe hailing from JP Morgan. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I work uh, at JP Morgan. I've worked here for about six months. I'm an associate software developer there. Wonderful. And as our resident expert in banking, uh, why should I switch to JP Morgan? I have Capital One. Um, I have Bank of America. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. That is... Uh... They have a really nice card. <laughs> The really nice metal card. If you have the credit card, I have that. Yeah, but so does Apple. True, I have an Apple card too, um, but th the Chase one is thicker. <laughs> it's not all metal. Either. <laughs> hey, I, I totally get it. You know, premium, premium card value is where it's at. Oh, we got Shia LaBeouf of all people telling us about great mortgage rates right now. You love to see oh, it. Crazy. So, yeah. folks, to, to give you sort of a, a breakdown of what's going on right now, uh, we naturally, uh, you know, we've done stage events in the past. A lot of those events are primarily voice-based. And every time that we've done those events, the focus has always been about the conversation and what's being said. And so what we were attempting to do today was to try to circumvent some of the limitations in Discord and allow for us to share screens somehow with what looks to be almost 160 people. Yeah, um, a lot. That, that all helps. Naturally, you know, someone suggested Replit, and I've used Replit before, but uh, there's a cap on the, the number of people who can look. And so as we get started here, um, what I'm going to recommend is that uh, if in the next couple minutes, Kevin or Zach can't get it uh, to work for everybody to see, what we'll do is we will actually focus on having all of, um, all of you just uh, basically look at the results of the coding process um, as Zach finishes his solution with Kevin. Uh, later yeah so, we, can't, we can't share it because people edit it yeah people can edit I'm, i don't know how to actually run this program oh <laughs> uh, you don't but you oh, don't okay. run programs at amazon uh for That's interviews great. so the reason we can't stream it on discord is because when you're doing a stage event eugene you have to um you can only use audio which is maddening. I have no idea why they won't let you do screen share. Probably because they, their servers can't handle it because none of us are paying for it. So there is like so the, there is a possibility of using Twitch. Um, the question is, of course, who you know, Kevin, Zach, are you willing to disclose your personal Twitch account? Um, I mean, we have a. Uh... Twitch lines programming and CS Queer Hackers account, but um, yeah, a little too late for that. We're already going basically. 
Fair enough. So what we'll do here is we'll, this is probably going to be a little less interesting because I'll have to be doing a uh, commentary real quick. Kevin, Zach, what service did you opt for? Uh, collab edit. Collab. Okay. Let me see. <laughs> Some folks are willing to wait for you to log into Twitch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so do we want to get started i mean the first part is an even uh coding yeah that's fine so i'll tell you what if you want it sounds like people are willing to wait for you to either log into google docs and share with 100 odd people but only you to have edit privileges or if you want to use whatever id or whatever Leco, whatever website that you want, um, and you want to try to use Twitch, if that's easy enough for you to log in. I'm going yeah, to assume you're up really quick, now. or where you guys can use your Twitch stream. Uh, that doesn't matter to me, I guess. Um, yep, Google Docs seems to be the vote so far. So, Kevin, while if you don't mind doing that, I'll go ahead and just run through the details of the intro. Is that okay sure. with you? Yep. All right. So since we have quite a few people here, just want to recap real quickly. The nature of this event is actually going to be pretty straightforward. It's like every other interview um, that Kevin normally gives, other than the fact that this can be a little bit more personable and dynamic. Uh, Kevin, as mentioned, is a bar raiser for Amazon. Uh, they're likely folks at other companies who do this as well. So the nice thing is that everything that you're going to be able to observe here and learn from here will likely help you to essentially apply the same techniques in other interviews for other companies. Amazon, you know, love them or hate them, whatever your opinion is. Naturally, Amazon is a top company right now for engineers. They hire tons of people. They have a lot of scalable impact for you to work on. And so for anybody who is looking to either get started with their career or they're changing their company to, you know, just basically go a little step further, take on a greater challenge for themselves. You know, talking to someone like Kevin today is a great opportunity uh, to understand his insight and what he, he brings to the table and what he expects other interviewers that you might encounter to bring to the table. So format simple, if you've seen binary search here or any other type of competitive programming or uh, just regular algorithm practice like LeetCode, it's gonna essentially be that sort of format where Kevin's presenting a question and Zach will attempt to break down his understanding of what the question is, understand the problem. He's gonna to attempt to implement it in response to how Kevin perceives the problem should be solved. If Zach decides to go brute force initially, totally cool. Um, if Kevin sees something and tries to, you know, push him in the right direction, don't be surprised. It doesn't mean Zach is struggling. It just means that Kevin might have a particular vision for how the problem is supposed to go. So with that being said, I'm actually curious before we get started, does anybody have any relevant questions while we're getting set up? By the way, are you good with being recorded, Zach? Yeah, um, FF Free Shot is being ready. Yeah. Cool. That's fine. Let's get started then. All righty. Right. Kevin, Zach, the floor is yours. Kevin, take it away. Yeah. And by the way, you guys can uh, fill in questions. We'll answer later into the uh, Dory uh, app. Uh, anyway, Zach, hi. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for being a guinea pig. Um, no problem. If you haven't figured this out, this is going to be basically an Amazon interview. Uh, I'm going to ask you a bunch of like code questions. I'm going to ask you uh, a technical question. I should probably ignore chat. <laughs> um, yeah, I have Discord closed. 
Yeah, so I'm going to spend uh, about 25 minutes on uh, Lico questions. I'm going to ask you four different LPs. Usually I'll ask two, but might as well get as much in as we can. Um, and then I'll ask a technical question, and we'll spend 25 minutes on that. Uh, I'll give you 15 minutes to – I'll give you feedback, and you can ask any questions as well uh, afterwards. Um, any questions? No, um, not yet. I guess let's get into it. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. I'll start with this one. Uh, give me an example of the time you were able to deliver an important project under a tight deadline. Sure, actually. So um, my most, well, I guess it's not my most recent project anymore, but um, a couple months ago, I was approached by our team lead to, um, we have, basically the product we're working at on JP Morgan is a payment app. Um, which you know, it's a big bank, so we do a lot of those. But this is supposed to be a novel payment app, and it's supposed to be a new way to uh, do payments that um, we currently don't handle. So part of that was um, allowing transactions to be done in a future date. So um, uh, currently, we or at that time, we had only been able to accept transactions that were for um, the current date. But we needed to be able to accept, you know, n plus one or n plus however many configured by uh, production uh, transactions, and we just didn't have the support for that. And our team lead told us that if we didn't have it done by um, the end of September, which at that point was about a month away, that our only client would walk, and then like our project would be pretty much like screwed. Um, at least for the short term, we'd have to find a new client. And uh, so he assigned me and one other person to go in and uh, plot out a design um, with him. Of course, he was heavily involved, but um, all three of us plotted out a design. We got the, the coding done and then we got the acceptance testings done. Um, and we actually were able to get it in in under a month and we had a couple weeks to spare. So um, I guess that's that's my example for that. Why was uh, why were they walking after a month? Was there no prep beforehand? Was there no indication that you needed to get it done? It the the project itself is very immature, so there's a lot of things that have to be done, and we were accepting a, a new client that uh, we basically have internal clients, and so the internal client was kind of just like, ah, you know, we probably won't need this right now. We should focus on other more high priority stuff. But then we had an external client approach us and say, we need to have this future date stuff done like by the time we we launch and we're launching next month. So you you have to have this done. Or at least we're going to start launching tests. um, And if like the the tests don't work, we're going to walk. So it sounds like more of uh, bad planning almost on leadership. Yeah, uh, maybe, but I, I think that I, I guess my responsibility at that point was just to deliver. It was so. Let's yeah. go into that. What what did what was what was your responsibility? What did you participate in? What were the results of that? Um. Uh. First, it was to understand the actual system that we were using, um, because I, I was relatively new at the time, so I, I had to get brought up to speed on what exactly the service was. And uh, so that so was my first responsibility. I had knowledge sharing sessions with the team lead. And also, I, I mean, dug through Confluence, basically. I had like two or three days before we started doing design talks to get up to speed. And a couple of weeks beforehand, my team lead let me know that there was going to be a big project that I was going to be a part of and to study like this thing. So in between my sprints or in between the other stories that I had to do, I was kind of just learning all that I could about this flow that we had and the specific service that we had to implement this future date stuff. Cool. Uh, let's keep going with your responsibility. What was next? What did you do? Um, next, it was to kind of contribute to the design talks. Um, really, because I didn't, I wasn't super familiar with the service, I um, mostly would just see like bad practices and try to correct them where I saw them. How do you correct um, them? Basically, I mean, during the design talks, it's really easy to just say like, hey, I see the partitioning strategy you're using for these tables, and one of these columns is going to get way too big. The partition is going to get way too big, and then we're going to run into issues if we start having millions of accounts. 
So instead we should, you know, partition it this way. And usually my team lead was pretty receptive to feedback. I didn't really have to push back on many of them, but there were a couple where I did. Um, and in those cases, I kind of just, I, I just, I showed them the hard numbers. I said like, you know, it's not going to be an issue if we're at a hundred thousand accounts or like 10,000 accounts, but once we get up to like 10 million accounts or billion accounts, which is possible with the scale of this program that we're trying to build, um, then we're going to be screwed. We have to redesign the table then. So it's better to just take the time it takes now and redesign it now than having to go back later and uh, just try to learn oh. what we did three years ago or whatever. How did you support that? What data did you present to support that uh, that viewpoint? Um, so Cassandra, uh, to my knowledge, Cassandra has it's the database technology that we use, but it has a, a limit where at a hundred thousand rows in a single partition, it starts to throw um, errors and it starts to be slower. Um, it, it'll still work fine, but all of the tr uh, all the database stuff is going to be really slow reads writes um, updates etc uh, so i showed how if there were 10 million accounts under like a single legal entity and under the current partitioning strategy we were using a couple of those partitions were going to be two or three or four hundred thousand rows long and at that point a hundred thousand it starts to throw errors and it says please keep them under uh, you know, like 10,000 or keep them under, I forgot what number exactly it says, but 100,000 is where it starts to throw our system errors. And it says this needs to be refactored now. So I showed that we could very easily get to that point if we were to achieve any sort of scale. Okay. So what, I mean, it sounds like you have a tight deadline here and it's a cool project. Was there ever a point where you had to pick between uh, one of those short deadlines and delivering on time or your standards? Like coding standards or anything like that? Because you were talking about having, uh, holding people to high standards, right? Yeah, I'm trying to think, I, I don't think so. I think instead what I did was I, I sacrificed some of my personal time, which, you know, maybe isn't the best for like a work-life balance standpoint. But I, since this was gonna be like a big project with my name attached to it. I thought it would be, it would be really important that. All right. So what about another, better. what about another example where you had to pick between uh, your standards and delivering on time? <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm trying to think of an example. I know there's plenty. I have to remember one. Um, I mean, I guess the, the most recent feature that I had to do um, was a, a small update to that um, future date process that I had. We had a API that went out to production support so they can um, see that the the new system was operating healthily. And they asked for a um, improvement to it. And my team lead didn't have a lot of time. So I kind of just bounce some like really simple ideas off of them. I was like, hey, I know this is a pretty minor feature, but we, uh, uh, how does this look? And he said, that looks fine. And so I just kind of, I banged it out in a, a day or two because they wanted it in the next release, which was going to be, uh, you know, a week from now. So I, I had it done in a couple of days and then I had testing done a couple of days after that. And there was, wasn't really a lot of time to go back and forth with the team lead and make sure the design was um, you know, perfect. And then at the end, my team lead said, like, hey, you know, if we could have gone back, I would have preferred you return like an energy or, or like an array instead of a string that says like all the values. Um, so it which, sounds like he was holding to standards, but what 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 were you defining as high standards during this process? It's a good question. Um If not that, um, you could provide another example where you had you insisted on maintaining really high standards, um, where even with other coworkers. Sure. Uh, I mean, so for 
a, a lot of it, I guess, revolves around Cassandra partitioning strategies because there's a lot of different ways to partition the same table. Um, recently, I uh, worked with a coworker of mine who had designed something, and it was a uh, this is something that he designed many months ago and coded. Um, but there just wasn't time to go back and look at it. And so um, a team lead wanted me to go back and look at it and just review his code. And then there were a few areas where um, like, I saw that the partitions could be too large if we got a billion accounts under a single um, banking entity. So like under the New York exchange or something like that, we had a billion accounts. Then we would start to have partitions that are too large. And I brought it to his attention and we were basically told like hey you know this feature's already been delayed for six months um management needs it now uh so like if it will work now then it needs to run now and i guess that point i kind of sacrificed my standards where i i would have preferred to go back and change it now when there isn't really that much data in the table rather than wait until the day where we might actually get a billion accounts because that's it's not unrealistic to have that under a bank. So did you say you uh, you sacrificed your standards to deliver? Yeah, I, I sacrificed my standards to deliver there. Um, so why would you do that? Because the timetable, it, it's just, I guess, the cost benefit. There was a, it, it needed to be done now. It had already been delayed six months, and the cost is something that I, I think that like the the redesigning would have taken like a week probably, and recoding and retesting and doing all of that would have taken like a, at least a week, maybe two, and we needed it in the next release, which is always two weeks away. So I figured because it's going to be a billion accounts, right now we're at zero accounts so we have time to go back and, and look at that and since we're such an immature organization every every deliverable counts right now okay um what data did you support your decision to commit to that um really the same data as, as the other one and i know you hate me using the same example multiple times but just the like the math of if we get to X number of um, accounts, then partitioning will be a problem. And it's just a matter of, is X conceivable in the near future? Or like, is changing this partitioning strategy easy now? Is it easy now or is it gonna require a bunch of migration? And for that thing that he already had built for six months, if there was another solution there and migration would have been another week or so. Sure. All right, let's uh, rotate this a little bit. Uh, do you have an example where you had a struggling team member and what did you do about it? Sure. Um, I mean, our team is growing really rapidly. So we have, I guess, a new struggling team member every every few weeks um, just because they're new to the organization and they don't understand everything quite yet. Um, what I tend to do is I, I, I'll reach out to them when they first get hired um, you know, introduce myself, let them know that I'm always open to questions. And then because of that, I end up being like the go-to guy for a lot of them. And I'll answer, um, you know, like, how do I look at my jewels pipeline or like, how do I deploy the service to another environment? And I just kind of balance that in between the other stuff I have to do. If there's a meeting that I'm in that I'm not really talking in, or I'm not really like, it's not really about me or for me. I just have to be there then you know i'm perfectly happy to answer questions during that time um okay so this is something that happens every time have you thought about putting together a uh onboarding wiki or anything yeah i mean there's there's a couple onboarding wikis already i guess it would be a good idea though to to gather some of the common things that aren't on the onboarding wiki that people are asking me about and and maybe make something to to be reused that's not something i'd really considered Okay. Um, what about another? Actually, let's rotate a little more same LP, basically. But tell me a time where you had to um, uh, per convey negative project status. So let's say you were behind to the customer. What did you do? 
Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, when I first got hired there, my first project was to go into every service, find code that was being reused, or I literally copy pasted in most of these cases, and just turn it into um, a big jar file or multiple jar files, depending on what you needed. But still, there was code that was being copied and pasted, reused everywhere. So I conglomerated it all into one big thing. But I had no idea how Jules worked or Jenkins worked. And so this was an entirely new repo. I had no idea how to upload um, like a, a Maven artifact to like our internal company portal. And so because of that, um, that task that was initially supposed to just be a quick like um, you know, like one sprint thing ended up being like a two and a half sprint thing because I had to learn about Jules and Jenkins and, um, you know, uploading Maven stuff and also go through the code base and find like a bunch of reused stuff and maybe generalize some things that weren't necessarily generalized at the time. And so at the end of every sprint, I had to kind of just be like, I'm really sorry. I'm learning a lot of new things. And because of that, I'm falling behind on this task but i hope to have it done um you know three weeks from now which is a sprint and a half basically but i, I try to give realistic timelines i suppose so how did they take that i mean luckily i was new so they didn't really care <laughs> i i haven't really run into an issue where someone has it's been a source of conflict i guess um usually i am delivering the things that I need to deliver on time. Yeah, big sense. Um okay. Uh let's move on to probably one more. I'm going fast and people are probably noticing this. I'm not trying to interrogate. I'm trying to get a bunch of examples out of what I would ask in an interview, but I would basically ask half of these and it would be more spread out. <laughs> um and then I'm not, as a lot of people are saying, I'm not trying to catch you off guard or catch you in a lie or anything. I'm actually just getting data. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on to a time where you had a disagreement with a coworker or a uh, manager. I thought there was a question already like this so far. Because <laughs> I, I, I remember <laughs> using up my example on this. Yeah, um, you delve a little bit into it, which is why I was asking follow-up questions on it. Okay. I mean, I, I could re-pull that, those two situations up where, you know, like... No, uh, if you covered it, well, you can move on to another one. Okay. Um, let's talk about a time where you were working on an initiative uh, in and it saw an opportunity to do something bigger, um, bigger than the initial focus. Sure. Um... I really don't want to reuse an example, but <laughs> I, I did for that common code thing that I did. Um, I guess what we were, what I was meant to do was, you know, go into the services that are existing and then, um, you know, just throw it all in there and then we'll use it from there. But now that I kind of own that service in a way, I will like go in and update the readme every release. I'll um, include better details on how to um, contribute to the next releases as I learn better ways and more efficient ways to do them. And then also while I create new projects and I see myself copy and pasting code, which happens, I realize, hey, you know, instead of copy and pasting this, I'm just going to generalize it, stick it into that reuse code thing, and then ship it into the next release of that. So I guess, in a way, that's making it bigger. Okay. Um, all right, let's dive a little more into that. Let's talk more about the technical part. What did you do? Um, for that specific project? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, technically, I guess it wasn't super impressive, but I, I did like have to make these Jenkins files from scratch and like these jewels files from scratch and um learn 
what that was, um, which was very annoying because um, I I don't really like DevOps stuff, but I know that's important. It's just sometimes it confuses me. Um, but yeah, I had to do that. And then I had to generalize a lot of these um, really specific methods. So like, um, for example, there's one where we take in uh, an executor service and also a couple objects, and then we shut down the executor service and write to a bunch of logs saying like, hey, the executor service for you know this legal entity and this effective date has been shut down or is in the process of shutting down. Um, and so we just did that, but changed the variable types and um, log statements for each time we used it. And so I had to go in and basically just say, instead of doing that, we could just pass in the executor service and then just say like, hey, the executor service is closing down. And I, I guess, I don't know, that, that one's not super technically complex. All right. Uh, probably a last question. Uh, tell me about a, tell me what you know about uh, microservices and how they connect in between them. Um, sure. What I know about microservices and what are the best practices around microservices are probably not congruent because at my organization, the way we use microservices is every service kind of has a purpose. Some of them are much bigger than others. Um, and I don't know if that exactly adheres to the you know, microservice dogma, but we have a few services that are, um, you know, event conglomerators, conglomerators, where they just, they get events from every other service, put it into a table, and then also pass events out to other services. And that's kind of how we use, um, how, how a lot of them connect with each other and how they communicate with each other. Um, we also send messages over Kafka, where we'll have, um, once one service finishes um, you know, sending a transaction, uh, it'll send out a message over Kafka and another service will consume that message and then uh, get the account balance for that transaction and then send that one out. And then another service will get that Kafka message and compare the balance with the, um, the transaction volume and then either approve it or deny it um, and then send a Kafka oh. message out to someone else. I, I, do you know up. do you know why we have kind of the standards of having single purpose microservices connect to other ones and to form uh, a larger uh, service is there a benefit behind how you connect I think scalability um some microservices get used a lot more than others so the ones that do get used more than others, you can run multiple instances of. Um, for example, our event listener, we have probably, I think, like 16 versions of it running at the same time. So that means that we're able to handle 16 times the volume that we'd be yeah. able to handle otherwise. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'm probably done with the uh, LPs, but the reason I ask that, and I usually don't ask it that way, is because... Usually I'll try to get a question uh, either with the highest standards or whatever, where I want someone to talk about how they build individual small libraries or build individual small uh, microservices to connect to instead of having a monolithic code base. So that's why I was trying to bring it up. It was just a bad question on my part. It's fine. I don't think it was a bad question. I do. <laughs> okay, that's fair. I'm not an interviewer, so. <laughs> yeah, um, I asked you a bunch of questions. Uh, I would have asked maybe four tops. Um, we would have spent a lot more time on each one, though. Uh, I just wanted to get an idea out to people. Of, here's some of the questions I would ask. Um, so you're not going to see questions this short. It's going to be a lot more in depth and a lot more diving into it. Um, specifically talking about how to, what you did particularly and your responsibility and what your uh, approach resulted in. So 
So hopefully this gives you an idea of a little bit of that, and then it gives everyone an idea of what I would usually ask. So just less. So nice job on that. Um, uh, thank you. I think I'm gonna ask problem solving. Uh, so this is an Amazon interview, like interview. Uh, Amazon is, if you didn't know, is responsible for shipping a lot of stuff around the world. Uh, you order something on Amazon, you get it the next day or two days if you have Prime. Uh, I assume you know that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How they do that is we have warehouses uh, all over the world, uh, I assume. Uh, and those warehouses hold uh, a bunch of items and they could ship it from there. And if they can't, then they'll ship uh, from somewhere else and it takes longer. Um, yeah, so warehouses will have delivery trucks and those trucks will ship to local houses. Uh, makes sense so far? Not, yeah. It's not the question, I'm just prefacing it. Uh, also, I need to start my timer. Um, okay, so uh, what each truck is responsible for doing before they uh, grab the packages and drive off to deliver is they'll say, hey, I could hold uh, an N number of houses uh, packages. So let's grab, uh, could someone time him out, the Jeff guy? John. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, uh, Amazon will, each delivery truck will go to the warehouse and say, all right, I'm going to deliver 100 packages. And I want to grab 100 packages, so I want to know what the closest houses are that I will deliver to. So what I want you to do is write a function that will take in the warehouse location in XY coordinates, uh, a list of houses, and those houses will be a list of a lot of houses. So they'll be probably all the houses in the state or all the houses in the country, um, not specifically just the local warehouses house and a number of houses to deliver to. And what I want you to do is come up with a function that will tell it what the closest houses are around the warehouse. Okay. All right. I've written down some information on a piece of paper, but I guess sure. that's not the best um, for, for sharing screens. Um, you're not okay. you're not looking at chat by the way, right? No, no, I have okay. my Discord. Yeah, someone did add me that I see that. Yeah, don't answer it. They're spewing off the answers. Okay, that's fine. Um so sure. Uh Which let's chat, start. it's fine if you want to do that. Um uh, feel free to participate in the chat. Yeah, that's I'm I'm not reading Discord, so you can say whatever you want. Um okay. so we're gonna Okay, so we're gonna have a method that takes in um, warehouse location, uh, which is X and Y. That's probably just gonna be an array. Um, then a list of houses and an integer that represents the number of houses to deliver to, right? And it's going yeah. to return a list of houses. Is that what it was? Yeah, so it'll give it a list of houses to deliver to. Okay, um, so then... <laughs> Probably won't get angry at me for that, sure. Um, so list house, what houses are... I guess that's not the best way to say it. Um, so what it, is house? Um, it is a class that is a representation of, of? an address. And how? how? <laughs> yeah. Uh, how is it? Yeah. Uh, uh, how are you representing it? The address. Sure. Um, I mean, we could do a string, right? String for house or address makes sense. I guess it makes it harder to do, um, you know, like house number, and then you want to do like zip code. And then you want to do that. So, I mean, what we could do, I guess, is have another class for, uh, you know, public. I mean, this, I mean, it's obviously can't go in the same file, but class address that would have, you know, like 
int zip code, um, and then like what else is that? Like in house number. And this wouldn't be in this order, uh, probably. It wouldn't make sense to be in this order. So you do. So I have a question. When I asked the question, how did I say I represented the house? I didn't write that down. I know you represented the, the warehouse location as a, a coordinate of X and Y. Right. So all the locations are X, Y, right? Okay, sure. So then I see what you're saying. So it's just an X and then just an Y. Right. And I guess you don't even have to really do that. Right. You can just have, I kind of like doing it this way though. Yeah, I mean, you're fine representing it how you want it, if it's a class or a pair or whatever. Yeah, I think I like it that way. I think it helps it be more readable. Um, so then you can say house, um, warehouse, right? Which can probably be represented by the same thing, but in real life probably shouldn't be represented by the same thing. We'd probably have a separate class for warehouse because it'd be more information on that. Actually, there is going to be more information, right? Because you want class warehouse to have like a list of items in it. So you want an X and Y. I don't know why it does that. I don't like that though. And then you also want it to have a list of items. So like or item, whatever, just items. You can put just What's like items? String even. Um, because that's all you really care about in this specific problem, right? You're just, is is mas matching the name of the item going to be enough? Oh, I don't care about the item. All I care is, hey, we're delivering to a house, right? Yeah, okay, sure. So then do warehouse. Warehouse, warehouse. And then list house, um, houses, and then int n where n is equal to number of houses to deliver to. Okay, well, that's easy stuff. <laughs> now, I guess I have to figure out a good algorithm to ship a number of items to a house. I drew a graph on my little paper here. Um, I don't know if that's the best way to represent it. What? I, I drew like circles and stuff and then lines connecting them like you know like the uh, dextras how do you even pronounce that um dextra that, yeah that one why would you do a dextra that's just what i was thinking while you were reading it out but now i'm thinking it's not really the best solution all right what was the question <sighs> question was how many houses can one truck deliver to no. Um, no. It's which houses can a truck deliver to? Nope. It was tell me the closest houses around the yeah. warehouse. Closest houses to the warehouse. Actually, I'll write that on here. You want closest houses to a warehouse. Right. That'd just be breath for a search, wouldn't it? Why? Because, I mean, you wouldn't want to do depth for a search, because, I mean, then you would just find the furthest house, <laughs> I guess. Uh, breath for a search allows you to discover all of the closest nodes and then, you know, just add them to your list of discovered items. Now, the question is. Do I remember how to implement breadth for a search? I think that is the best way to do this. So why are you representing it as a uh, graph? Why why am I or why aren't I? Why are you? Why am I? Sounds like you are. Yeah, I did. I put it on my little paper here, but it's hard to draw on the IDE. Um, so I think it would be a graph because you have multiple houses. And they have distances between them. 
um, and you want the distance to be the lowest. So it the, would be too, I want the too. closest houses to the warehouse, right? Yeah. I don't care how close they are between each other. Ah. Uh, man, I actually thought of this just like a week ago. It's uh you want to discover Discover the path to a source node. The source node would be like warehouse. You want to discover everything that's close to that. Oh, man. So let's define what a close house is. Um, if I'm doing a graph, it's just going to be a number on the line between the warehouse and the house. What's the number? The distance. OK. So you know the distance between a house and the warehouse, right? Why is Coach refreshing? Wait, yeah. OK. Wait, what happened there? Reloading. OK. OK, so I mean, you would get the x and y coordinates of the warehouse and the x, y coordinates of the houses. And you would do the distance formula on them, I guess, to figure out the distance. All right. <laughs> What's the distance formula? Uh, uh, just assume it's there for you. OK, sure. So you would do the distance formula between the two houses. And I guess one way I'm thinking of doing this is, um, let's say, like, n equals 10. You can. Put the first uh, 10 houses into the list. And then as you iterate through the rest of the houses, uh, you find the biggest house and kick it out if, or I guess, the biggest distance. Kick it out if it is. Um, bigger than the current house distance. OK. Right? That makes sense. Yeah, it sounds like it. How are you going to do that? I, mean, I could just have a for loop, I guess. I got to actually code. Um, so four and i equals zero and then there's probably gonna be something before this but i is less than houses dot size um and then i plus plus we are going to uh first have a uh integer house uh biggest house end list Let's do that. Not initialized anything first. So then we will say if uh, well, let's first equals uh, you know houses that get zero. Um, so it's initialized to something, and then we could say if biggest house in the list is bigger than houses.get i or um now of course we need a list of houses that's um houses to return is equal to new array list um array list is probably fine for this uh and then we want to initialize it to a size of n um, or n, of course, is the number of houses delivered to. So then, no, we don't want to initialize it at all. Okay. I'm thinking we want to say if biggest house in the list is greater than the current house or um, houses to return um, dot size is less than n. Um, yeah, 
makes sense. Might be less than equal to. I'll have to do the math on that one. Um, so then it can't be initialized to the value because otherwise this is always going to ring true. So yeah, we just make it an empty array list and then we just add it in. And then houses to return um, dot add houses dot get i. And you know, probably for code readability, it's probably better to have like house current house equals get uh, houses dot get um, i. And then we could just replace wherever this is with this. Okay, and then turn um, houses to return. So I get what you're trying to do here. I don't yeah. understand how you're doing it, though. It sounds like you're uh, trying to keep track of the uh, closest houses as you go, right? Yeah. So how are you doing that? It's kind of brute forcey, but I'm just adding every house to the list and then iterating through them. But I'm thinking now it might be better to just sort them and grab the first N instead. Yeah, sounds like a good starting point with sorting, right? Yeah, now that I have the solution in front of me, I realize that this is going to be painfully slow. The idea is actually a very optimal way of doing it, but the way you're doing it is painfully slow. So, I mean... Let me ask you this. What is a good uh, data structure that will allow you to keep track of the lowest... Uh, or the the lowest numbers in a list uh, in log in time, and to insert in log in time. And to okay. go even further, what if I wanted to find the lowest element in O of one time? Oh, uh, so if you're gonna find the lowest element in O of one time, I guess you can just. In my head, you sort it and put it in a linked list. Because that's going to give you the O N or O one. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure like grabbing from either end of a linked list is O one. Um but that doesn't keep track of the the size of them, I guess. All right, uh, let's yeah. let's go with your second solution. Let's go with the sorting one. Yeah. All right. I got to remember how to do a sorting algorithm. Why? Why? Are you saying you're going to write the whole sort or you're just going to use the sort? Oh, I mean, if I can just do like houses.sort before it, I'm all for right. that. <laughs> well, let's start with that. Okay. Well, I mean, if we do houses.sort, then I don't have to worry about this. And then, honestly, I don't have to worry about this either. It's just um, i is less than n. And we just grab the, I mean, we just, yeah, we don't have to worry about this either because it's already less than n. So like that. Why is it doing that? Okay. That seems to make sense to me. If I can just do the sort. We just grab the first ten and you know, eat it. There, there it goes. Um, how are you sorting? Um, whatever algorithm Java bestows on me. Right, whatever. but what are you sorting? Sorting the list of houses. Mm, I don't have the distance formula in here. I think that's what you're trying to get at. Right. Okay, so I don't remember the distance formula. That's something I would Google. Just um, uh, assume that you have it. Sure. Okay. So then 
I have to have a data structure that maps houses to their distance. And although I did say map, I don't know if hash map is the best thing to use. I don't think so. Um, I mean, maybe, but I, I don't think so. I could always do like a, a meaty list that is just like So what's what are you trying to do? I'm trying to like attach plain, houses plain to English. distances. I'm trying to map every house to a distance from the warehouse. Okay. And then you're trying to sort from there? Yeah. I'm trying to sort the distances. And so then why just... not keep track of both the distance and the house? keep track of both the distance and the house but how would i correlate the distances with the houses i guess what about a tuple yeah that's fair <laughs> oh man i've never written a, a tuple or a tuple and um is it just like literally uh house um int um house with distance equals new double um i don't know if that's the right syntax on that let's assume it is yeah okay sure um so then we would do houses with distance that sort and honestly i'd probably do it the other way not that it really matters and it, There, whatever thing it passes in, I wanted to sort the ints. And also before this, I want it to do like houses with distance dot um you know shit. Whoops, I didn't mean to get rid of everything. Yeah, don't um, do that. <laughs> it's good. We have control Z for a reason. Um, we can do two for loops, I guess. That's not too bad. Two n. But then we don't even have to do the second for loop, I guess. We do, actually. We do have to do the second for loop because we have to sort them. So why are you focusing on, focusing on the second for loop right now? What are you trying to do right now? Right now, I am trying to get every house and get the distance from the warehouse Assign it as an int into this tuple for the house. Great. Let's do that. For int j equal yeah, equals zero, sure. J is less than um houses dot size um and then j plus plus. Okay. So then I guess why are you using j? It's the next iterator I use after I. Right, but I is lower, right? Can't you reuse I? I could. You're right. You're right. I could reuse I. You don't I. have to change it. Just leave it. It's fine. Okay. Well, I've just never seen someone. <laughs> I've, I've gone I, J, K, L. I've, I've gone all the way to M when I first started. But if I know I go further than J, something's wrong. I'm doing, not, I'm doing something not right. Um, all right. So for every house so then we're just going to get like i don't know, get distance where that's get distance warehouse house uh houses dot get i and what do we want to do with this um we want to do like houses uh, with distance dot add i want to add this as the integer and then houses dot get um, I as the house. Okay. That seems to make sense to me. It's not very well written. I guess it's hard to read if you want to do just like in. I mean, we don't have to do that. That's fine. Yeah. Okay, sure. But. So yeah. what is this doing? You're get, you're adding the houses and then you're sorting. Yeah. And then you're turning. 
After I sort, I grab the first n from the list and then return. Now, so what are you returning? Not the Yeah, wait, I'm I'm returning a list of houses. Right. But what are you actually returning? What is oh, oh uh how this is yeah. thick. Yeah. yeah, this is this is this. It's okay, so houses with distance sort. So then add current house. Ooh, whoops, I did something. Okay, there we go. So current house is houses that get I. Um, I is less than N. So I want to do houses with distance dot get I. Yeah, but what is dot get? What is the element? It's going to be a tuple of integer and house. So then, can I just do dot get dot get? That's probably not great. I think it's, I don't know, do dot get dot uh, second or something. Sure. Um, so that's going to return the house. And then, yeah, then house, house, or yeah, is equal to that. Then we add it to the houses to return and return the houses to return. Okay, so you're returning a list of houses then, right? Yes. Cool. Um, all right, let's stop here then. That was 25 minutes, by the way. 45 minutes? 25. Okay. A little better. Was so, that a lead code easy? Or it probably I have wasn't no idea. I don't yeah, do lead code. Just a, yeah, that's fair. I don't do it either, <laughs> as you can tell. <laughs> Ooh. So... I I want to get your feedback first. I want you to tell me how you did. Uh, on this, I think I did very bad. Um, Why? I was anxious walking into it, and then I think I had to refactor probably like three or four or five times or something like that. I had a bunch of solutions, and then ended up figuring out that actually the solution doesn't work, and I had to rely on hints a lot. So let's start from the very beginning. What did you do? at the beginning i don't know if i i guess i tried well, to define the problem yeah well no but let's re uh just to give you a hint you created a uh warehouse or you created a house class and you said address and zip code and uh more things right yeah why did you do that i had an assumption that that is what was needed for this problem so why didn't you ask if it was needed? Because I forgot. <laughs> but I do this know... Is a, this is the yeah. problem solving interview. I'm not here to ask you really complicated data structures and algorithms. That's a different interview. Um, I, I literally, I think half of your problems would have been solved if you spent the first two or three minutes just clarifying what I asked, clarifying what I wanted, how I wanted it, um, clarifying, all right, uh, you set a pair for the, the warehouse. Do you also want to pair for the house? Right? And if we, uh, you asked that, I'd be like, yeah, please do uh, X, Y for both. Um, yeah, wow, that is crazy. Because I do remember you saying X, Y for warehouse, and then I just assumed in my head, okay, X, Y for warehouse address for house yeah i uh, i uh, i've never actually seen someone say all right i'm doing a warehouse with xy and then do a house in a different format usually everyone assumes that it's xy for everything and that that part's true but yeah uh literally the the question is saying all right we're gonna calculate the colliding distance between the warehouse and every single house sort it cut the first end Yeah. Okay. I I think if you're asking clarifying questions and you were asking what it was really asking, um, apparently we're reloading again. Uh, you would have had a better chance to catch on pretty quick to that. That's definitely fair. Yeah. Thank you. I I definitely did not ask enough clarifying questions. Yeah. So another key part of that would have been to use an example. 
literally just write out, all right, warehouse is one, one, uh, house is one, three, negative two, eight, um, 13, 15, and just write out a six element array and then ask, Hey, are these three elements what I would be returning? And then in all likelihood, you would see it as an array or a list. Um, it doing that, you'd be like, okay, I could just sort this, figure out what the closest distances are. Um, problem solving is always starting with clarifying the question and asking yourself if you really know what it's asking. Um, spend a reasonable amount of time. I was going to say take all the time you need, but don't. Uh, spend a reasonable amount of time to make sure you understand the question. Uh, and then spend a little bit of time to really understand uh, what it's really asking. Um, like what, it, what the solution is really looking for. Uh, so those are two things. Then from there, you figure out, okay, what are the edge cases I'm going to compare? When is this going to fail? What happens when I have no houses? Or what happens when the number of houses is less than N? Uh, do we ship a, a truck with less houses than uh, unexpected error? <laughs> oh, is that what you got? I still yeah. have it. <laughs> Weird. But yeah, all right. What happens when N is greater than uh, the number of houses? What happens if N is less than zero? Um, when does it break? And what, what do you do when it breaks? A good question would have been to ask. It's like, okay, we're filling uh, delivery trucks to ship the houses. Uh, it's inefficient to uh, send a delivery truck with less packages than it can hold. So in that case, if there's less houses to ship to than a truck can hold, what do you expect me to do with that? You're solving a problem. You're coming up with all the ways that that problem could break, and you're trying to figure out uh, what to do in those cases. You're trying to get all those answers from me with clarifying questions to say, okay, this is what you want here. Um, this is the first five minutes of clarifying the questions coming up with edge cases, right? Then you should know everything about the question that's being asked, right? Makes sense so far? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, and then you get into, all right, let's talk about how to solve this because that's what we're doing. We're solving a problem. Um, what is the simplest way of doing this? Oh, we could probably just uh, create a list of distances and houses and sort and then cut off the first in. Um, great. That, that's uh, in login time uh, plus in. Uh, and then either you would have come up with an alternative to use a, a max heap uh, or a priority queue, or I would have hinted at it after you did the sort. But uh, then I would have said something like, all right, what if we could utilize the fact that we only need K elements? Can we just keep track of the first K elements as we go? Uh, and then I would have uh, led you to a max heap. Uh, so Ted, no, it's a max heap. You want to know the biggest element in O of one time and then add smaller elements as you go. Um, yeah, that would have been the step up. That would have been like, okay, we started with the sort. We went to a max heap to do in log K time. Uh, all right. Now that we're done with that, let's talk about uh, either me going to bigger data or cutting out elements or the alternative is uh let's talk about testing we know when it fails let's see if it fails like it's supposed to or let's come up with use cases that say uh this works as expected or it fails as expected when it happens um and it's not a big deal in the problem solving one it's a lot bigger of a deal in logical and maintainable the question's easier in that in that interview but uh if you have different functionality, so if you're doing one thing and then all of a sudden you switch to do another thing, so let's say you wrote the um, uh, the Euclidean distance function, uh, separate that into a different function just to make it more readable. Uh, again, not a big problem with problem solving, but if you do it, it provides more data for the debrief. So let's say you 
fail the logical maintainable part horribly. But if I get enough data points for that, then I could say, hey, he showcased it here. So it, it's, you want to bring clean, logical, maintainable code to every interview, regardless. And uh, good thing is, variable-wise, it was pretty good. Um, like, it was pretty readable for the most part. Um, you just work on splitting those up if you can. So that's, yeah, do you have any questions so far? I, I guess, uh, so separating these things into objects, is that um, something that I should be striving for, for like a, a logical maintainable interview? Separate it into functions, objects only when they ask. Okay, that makes sense. And they'll tell you usually if they want objects, but yeah, different. If you're doing something different than the function you're writing, write in a different function to call it. Yeah, okay. So one like thing I was kind you, of doing with the, the get distance and stuff like that. Yeah. One thing that you did that was a cool potential solution, and I might use it in a future uh, solution, is you're trying to calculate the shortest distance, assuming roads and graphs and directed graphs and all that, um, which is a cool idea, but it's not what I was asking. Um, that's why I kept asking, why are you using a graph? Why are you using a breath research or Dijkstra or whatever? Um, if you clarified the question, I think that would not have been a problem. Yeah. Could be a step up. I might switch, say, all right, we sorted. Let's switch to find the shortest distance between all the warehouses. Um, yeah. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yeah, I guess not. Not, not right now, at least. So you're you're right with the technical part. It was I would not have passed that. Um, you probably already know that. Uh, yeah. But for LPs, it was pretty good. Uh, you had pretty good examples. Um, I was quick and I was rapid firing them. You won't get that in an interview. You'll have one or two LPs, and it'll be a lot more time to answer them. But I wanted to give examples of questions you might see in the interview. Um, any questions on that part? Um, I guess not on that part specifically. But let's say hypothetically, I I have this exact same performance in a, a normal Amazon interview. Uh, there's like two other interviews after this, right? There's like a logical maintainable and then another one, I think. Uh, logical, um, maintainable, data structures, and long the system design. If you're going okay. for L5. Yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to make L5, but let's say I do decent on all of them. Would a, a performance like this in a problem-solving interview prohibit me from getting, a, I guess, a higher? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, as the bar raiser, I'm trying to figure out... I'm trying to get as much data as possible to a hiring manager. Um, if you do, if you perform like this on the technical part, I will fail you as an interviewer. But as the bar raiser, I'll try to figure out if anyone else got those data points elsewhere. So if you were asking clarifying questions on other interviews and then you're coming up with good edge cases and actually testing them for them in other interviews, then that's solid data points that could be applied to my negative interview. And uh, chances are it would help out there. Um, so overall, our goal as a loop, as a four or five person loop, is to get all the possible data points to showcase raising the bar. If you fail one, but everyone else gets those data points, then it's not a big deal. Um, alternatively, if that's not the case, it's up to the hiring manager to figure out if you're uh, touchable. Uh, with all the data, if you're close, they may say, yeah, it's worth trying to coach you and trying to... Um, uh, help you with the problem solving part. And then if that's something that I'm satisfied with, that if you did well on that, then it would have raised the bar, then uh, it wouldn't be a big deal either. So basically, okay. the hiring manager says yes or no, whether or not you're getting hired. Uh, my job as the bar raiser afterwards is to say, okay, you're, you're hiring. 
does this person raise uh, the bar for your team? Um, so yeah, there's there's two people that have to say yes to get a hire. Uh, there's only one person that has to say no to not get a hire, not to either the bar raiser or the uh, hiring manager. Okay. Believe it or not, none of the other interviewers actually matter. Um, they provide data, but they don't have a say in the vote. Yeah, I remember you mentioning that uh, last week, <laughs> and I was, I was shocked. Um, okay, I guess for my LPs, um, do you think that I overused um, any examples, or was there like obvious room for improvement that you saw? Um. I don't know if there was a permit. I, I would have liked to see you dive deeper into the technical part. What I forgot to tell you, and I, I usually tell people, but I forgot, is that uh, I don't care what your team did. I don't care what the big picture was. What I care about is what you do, how you did it, and what the result of your effort was. Um, and I want you to dive as deep as you can technically into this and tell me in a bar raising way, what you did. Um, and if I spent a little more time on each part, uh, I might have been able to dive a little more. Um, but again, I think you had solid examples to start with. Just dive a little more into them and then uh, find better, uh, find additional examples as well. Yeah. Okay. I'll definitely spend some time thinking about this. Yeah. Yeah, again, I don't think LPs went bad at all. I think it was good. Um, I think your technical part wasn't, but yeah, the LP was good. Okay. And Thank believe you. it or not, I'm not trying to get you to trip up. Like, there was one example where you, I asked you about a time where you uh, had to pick between having the highest standards and uh, delivering. Um and what I was looking for is when you refuse to deliver to maintain good standards or deliver on time to maintain good standards. And you gave me the opposite. Any other questions? No, I think, I think I'm good for now. Cool. Well, thanks for uh, uh, doing this. I hope everyone learned so far. Uh, FF, are you around? Oh, yeah. <laughs> time for a uh, quick Q&A. Yeah, so real quick before we before we dive into that, uh let me first just say Kevin, thank you for being thorough and also going a little bit uh beyond your typical format to ask those additional questions. It's good to hear sort of the the range of questions that can be asked. Um naturally there was probably more that you could have to hit all LPs, but it's nice to have that example, right? Yeah, um, and so it just a reminder on that i hit four or five lps i would never do that in an interview what i would do is two and i would go deeper into them uh i did four or five lps so i could give people a bigger picture of what i would be asking in different interviews yeah that absolutely and that's and i'm glad that you vocalize that again one for the chat to understand the context of what you were doing but also for Zach's sake so that you know the rapid fire doesn't seem to be the standard or the norm you know um, yeah, it's, it's not it'll be slower absolutely yeah, i don't know if that's easier or harder <laughs> <laughs> well oh it's harder for me i would have gotten more data if we went slower but i'm not looking for data i'm looking for how you answer so you can get tips yeah i appreciate that and naturally, I want to say, you know, it's been said already, but just want to vocalize on behalf of over, shoot, we had, what, 180 people this evening. Thank you, Zach, for standing up on the stage, virtual stage, and allowing yourself to go through the gauntlet with one of, you know, one of the top folks for interviewing in Amazon, frankly to because of you know kevin's significance uh with his role we i understand that you know it's a mock and to some degree it's it can, we kind of gave the impression like yeah just show up it's fine um so you might have got a little bit more than you bargained for but you 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 hung in there you swung uh 
you swung back with some good with some good thoughts and 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 responses to the questions and of course uh you grappled with the the coding portion and most importantly it sounds like you came out and learned something and that's really all we can hope for that's that's our 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 goal here with every single thing that we do so zach generally you know i know you weren't looking at the chat but everyone was pretty much rooting for you and thank you that's that like honestly like it was stream people it was was honestly equal numbers of people rooting for you and yelling at kevin but yeah i saw that (laughs) but obviously that's you know that's the the nature of of perceived competition right um this is a team sport kevin and zach working together trying to get through the interview and that's something that i think is also important for people to acknowledge is that aspect of the interviewer not going in expecting or wanting you to fail but trying to give you an opportunity to succeed and trying to give you a chance to demonstrate it and that's the hopefully the mindset that people will walk away with this evening regardless of how they felt in the moment as uh it seemed like kevin was grilling so quite quite the opposite by the way i i go into every interview ready to pass it's up to you to prove me wrong there you go. Start at 100%. <laughs> Whittle your points down <laughs> over time. Yeah. I, I, rarely, I rarely fail LPs. Uh, it is something that I'm very easy with. Um, I'm just not very easy with technical questions. Well, yeah, I absolutely. appreciate that because that's definitely my weakest suit so far. Um, at least I think so. All right. So I was going through that whole spiel trying to get some folks uh questions in uh for the record we are at uh i guess it would be 6 30 pacific time a little past 6 30 pacific time and uh to respect kevin and zach's time i am just going to clarify real quick uh are you open to answering some of this q a uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. my original plan was a Q&A afterwards, so I, I'm good to stick around. Absolutely. And I Zach, the door in there. Uh, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm good to stick around. I don't know how many questions are going to be asked to me, but I'll, I'll be here. Excellent. Well, we appreciate your time. And let's go ahead and jump right into it. So we got Puppy Treats coming in with the question, deliver on time or keep high standards? So... Let's go ahead and pass this to Kevin because I think that was really uh, aimed at him. I there's two LPs. There is insist on the highest standards, where I'm looking for you to uh, not uh, deliver on time, to push back and say we cannot deliver until it is a high standard of coding, testing, and integration test. Um, that you're pushing for those standards to make sure that it's maintainable and logical the entire time. Um, the alternative is if you have a, uh, that you need to deliver even without the high standards. If that's the case, I would expect a plan to say, all right, we had to deliver and skip the standards at first, but we have a plan of action that will be this date we're going to start tackling the testing. This week, we're going to tackle integration tests. This week, we're going to test readable code and so on. Um, so that would be more deliver results with the hint of it's just high standards. So it was two. It could be split up into two questions or two LPs. Excellent. And I hope that answered their question. I'm going to go ahead and give it a mark here. I I'm don't know bounce- where you're at. Oh, we opened up event questions. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, that's where the question is if you want to want to look it's at it. It's also Dory. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to bounce back and forth here. Let me see. So take this question from anonymous Ivory Lemur. I love that. What do we do when an interviewer asks a question and the answer doesn't seem to be what they're looking for? This question is a little vague, but I'll go ahead and pass it to you again, Kevin. Um, do with it what you will. 
I mean, I should be giving you hints as an interviewer if you're not going where I want you to be. Um, you could actually ask. You know, you could ask for a hint, or you could ask if that's uh, what I was looking for. And uh, I will probably tell you along the lines of, yeah, please keep going, or uh, kind of here's what I'm looking for in this direction. So, uh, yeah, ask and um, see. But I should be giving you hints. Doesn't always happen, though. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it definitely can vary, right? Yeah. All righty. And that's Let's my job as a bar racer to lecture interviewers afterwards to make sure that they don't do that again. <laughs> don't worry, I'm just as hard as a bar racer in the interview that I am on the interviewers. That's good. All right, let's. We're going to go off of vote count here. Uh, <laughs> any chance of the CSCH team making this a weekly or monthly event? I'll actually answer that. We currently uh, are looking to do these monthly going forward, doing them on a weekly basis is quite a bit of uh, coordination, um, but it's definitely viable to do it on a monthly basis. It also allows us to have some breathing room with other activities that we have going on. That so, being said, there was 170 people here, so clearly it's a well-wanted thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. So the the current uh, the current idea that we've been passing around has been one week you do a sort of information session, kind of like what Kevin did last week. Um, sort of drop the the general details about the interview process, what it's like to be an interviewer. Um, what the expectations are for the candidate. And then the subsequent week, the, the, the week following, like we did today, we would do the real mock interview with one of you lovely people listening tonight. And so that's the general framework that we've come up with. And so because of that, uh, that, that pattern that we've been talking about, I think it's going to make sense to do it monthly. Kevin may, uh, maybe more ambitious and want to do it bi-weekly or something. Um, and that's something we can certainly talk about as a possibility. Yeah. And I, I, the idea I had was to make, make it popular when, uh, interviews were happening. So when there's, uh, let's say internship, uh, interviews going on, which is probably now I wanted to set up a thing where people could get an idea of how to interview as an intern and so on. So, um, but during the summer, we're not going to have those because you guys are going to be interns already. Mm -hmm. So I think it's an elastic uh, program, basically. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be, uh, it's going to come down to timing, really. Uh, yeah. What's the best time for everybody, depending on where they are in the, in the job hunt. Yep. So let me, let me come back over here to Dory, what are the most common LP questions asked to new grad software developers? Uh, I don't have questions. Every person's allowed to ask whatever they want. There's a question bank and I asked some of them, but uh, it's up to the interviewer. It's usually uh, what LPs are going to be asked and you're not going to get things like uh, um, Invent and Simplify and things like that as a new grad, but some of the more complicated ones, even deliver results. You probably won't get as hard on, um, but assist on high standards and earns trust and things like that. You probably will. Yeah. All right. That's probably not what they were looking for, but something. <laughs> no, it's a good answer. I mean, that's just the reality of it, right? Yeah. All right. We got a question here from Tosh. Which implementations on the coding portion would have been enough to be a pass? Heap, priority queue, quick select, normal sort with a special comparator. Well, again, this is a problem solving question. What I'm evaluating is your problem solving process, not uh, not specifically the answer. Um, like, did you start by clarifying questions? Did you consider all the edge cases? Did you test it? Did you um, come up with scenarios that may be a problem? Like, all right, what happens if I need to deliver a half-empty truck? Uh, what do you expect as a customer when I do that? Uh, and so on. And then 
Coding wise, I usually prefer to get to the point of the heap or at least sort with some of the heap discussed. Uh, the higher you go up, the more I expect though. Sometimes I'll expect you to consider more and more things. Customer side, um, I might expect you to consider the customer, consider the big picture. What if we want to take this to a multi warehouse scale? What happens when you mix uh, states and so on uh, and have bigger questions. So how you approach it is going to even be different from an L4 to L5 to L6. Um, so it's the same question. Someone said during the uh, the interview, it was like, oh, this is easy. Why would he give this to anyone? It's like, but this question has multiple levels per level. So uh, mm. it could be scaled out. I don't know if I answered the question, but I think no no i mean it was part part of the part of that kind of question is to sort of get into the mind of the interviewer right like what yeah what are you looking for um but it, yeah. in in terms of the framing of the question they're thinking in terms of the technical oh, aspect right like yes. the specific coding solution but that's not solely what you're looking at right yeah uh, problem solving is multiple things. Lo logical and maintainable will be the easiest question you have, but it'll be the easiest one to fail because they want you to write clean, maintainable code, and most people uh, don't in interviews. Mm -hmm. um, not saying that they don't in real life, but in interviews, they forget how to write clean code. Um, mm -hmm. You may not get hard questions because we're evaluating different things between problem solving and logical and maintainable. The hardest question you probably get is data structures and algorithms. And that's because we're actually diving into your data structures and algorithms knowledge. But yeah, yeah to answer that question, I want at least to sort moving into a heap. So just a quick follow-up for Zach. Um, for, based, on, based on how the interview went, does Kevin's reasoning makes sense or do you do you feel like there's like a different approach that you would have been more comfortable with um given more time no that, i mean that was pretty standard as far as like what i've gotten from other interviews um it was just a little more intense i guess i, I didn't see that there was nothing that really seemed unfair or anything like that yeah people are usually a lot more afraid of me as an interviewer i'm pretty uh I, I come off as harsh. Um, I'm not. At least I hope I'm not. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty intimidating. Try yeah. not to be, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, you did a good job trying not to be, but don't worry. I'm intimidated by everyone, so. <laughs> oh, come on. Not, not with that, that face, right? You're really just a dog talking through the chat, right? <laughs> That's um, true. My dog was there the whole time listening <laughs> to me. <laughs> All right, let's go back to Dory. We have Anonymous Beige Llama. Great name Where? conventions. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Are typical technical interview rounds in Amazon as conversational as this mock interview? You know, EG, is it welcome to bounce ideas off the interviewer or should I be taking the lead? Uh, I, yeah, I actually read that as controversial and... Um... I had a different answer for that, but for conversational, it is a conversation. You're, you are, when you come in as an interviewer, we just want to have a technical discussion with you. We want to come in and see how you approach problems, how you tackle uh, your algorithms and data structures and how you write clean code. And then your um, LPs, we're just trying to figure out what you've done and see if they align to our LP. So it is a conversation. Yeah, that seems like a pretty straightforward answer to that. Um, Zach, in, in terms of interviews that you've done in the past, how conversational have you been with, say, other companies, like when you were interviewing for JP Morgan or anywhere else, internships otherwise? Was it similar, different? Uh it was pretty similar. I, the way that I try to combat interview nerves, which I get 
a lot of even for this mock interview i had a lot of nerves walking in for some reason but um i usually try to like strike up a conversation with the uh interviewer try to make them seem less like a like a super hyper intelligent like demon and more like a person that is just looking to see if i would fit their company so i guess like usually they're pretty conversational or if they're not i try to make them that way Okay, so it sounds like it was relatively uh, familiar. So that that's good. Just want to double check. All right. Let's hop back on over here to the chat. Okay. Our friend from Down Under asks, is name dropping, quote, disagree and commit, quote, or, quote, ownership, quote, in an what? Amazon, yeah, I'm not sure the language on this. Um, I think I, I think what they're getting at is is name dropping one of the LPs like disagree and commit or ownership in an Amazon behavioral interview acceptable, or is it better not to bluntly name drop the actual LPs like your Ted Bundy? Okay, I don't care. Uh, I literally don't care if you name it great um i'll probably tell you you're wrong if it's the wrong one uh hell you could ask me and i'll probably tell you which one i'm evaluating i i literally don't care um others may uh others might uh enjoy the fact that you're you know which one i'm asking and t and tailor your answering answers to it um yeah i i don't really have an answer it just varies per person yeah that makes sense like most things, there's the human element that people want to pretend isn't there during the interview process, right? But it's still a factor. Yeah. Oh, um, I've had people ask me if I was the bar racer, and I'll tell you if I am. No, oh, really that blunt. <laughs> well, I won't come straight out and say, yeah, I, I'm the bar racer. If you ask me if I am, I will. Right, but right, right. Again, it's, it's just another interview. It's not a bar racer interview. And that actually kind of segues nicely into this anonymous yellow hamster question. Other than being a bar raiser, what level are you at Amazon? I'm a, I'm a level five working on six. Julio. Very easy question. All right. So here from the game and Godzilla we have, is it better to say, Hey, I know the answer to this question. I'm a coded in a minute. Or play dumb and act like this is the first time I'm hearing about this. I feel like this was answered already, but I'll I'll let you vocalize it. I will fail you if you try to fake it. Um, everyone will fail you if you try to fake it. Uh, we know we could catch it. It's the most obvious thing in the world when you're faking something. Um, it, take that as what you will in whatever way. But if you fake it, we know. Um, straight up, just tell us, and we'll probably all right say. Tell me a quick TLDR of how you would solve this, just to see if you're not lying about knowing it. Uh, or we may go from there and expand it to a different question or a harder question or whatever. Um, so be honest. Be honest. Honesty is the best policy for sure. You don't earn trust if you're not honest. 100%. All right. Pink Ant Eater asks, "How are you feeling, Zach?" Uh, now, I'm I'm feeling like relieved. Uh, partially like I kind of messed up, but also like I know where to to go and learn. It was really I'm really grateful for the opportunity, honestly. Right. Um. Yeah. It seems like a like a lightning rod into what I should actually practice or what I should practice more on. That's awesome. And that's what we're looking for, right? We just want to make sure that it's worth your time and, uh, you know, that the practice matches the experience that you'd expect. It's, it's great when, you know, folks mock interview each other, uh, but sometimes you just don't know who you're getting, right? Kevin verified, you know, Kevin's deal started this whole thing. It's always good to have uh, folks who have been doing this for a while uh, come in and give you you know, the 411, give you the, give you the real, uh, interview process. So very good. Yeah. I'm incredibly thankful. Absolutely. Well, we have less than 
10 minutes to 7 p.m. Pacific, which means it's almost 10 o'clock your time, Zach. So we'll be wrapping up here shortly. Uh, maybe like one or two more questions, and we will move on. Uh, <laughs> Google mock interview next week? Uh, no. Um, that's that's not happening on such short notice. But Google mock interview uh, should be in the works, I believe, Kevin. Um, thank Hopefully. You. Yeah, we, we have somebody that should be able to give that, other than you, of course. I, I know you could, um, potentially. Well, I want it to be more modern. I want somebody who's there now and or was there recently. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely makes sense. All right, so let's just look at it, the one then. Andy50 asks, what do you need for strong hire, as in, in the context of this interview? Uh, you won't get a strong hire for me. Um, Strong hire means that if you go somewhere else, it will be a, a negative impact to Amazon. Uh, and no L4 will ever be that good. Um, if Jeff Dean interviewed, and that's a strong hire. Uh, if Jeff Dean does not come to Amazon, if, he's, if we tell him no, then he'll go somewhere else and build something really cool that, will, that could have been us. Um, no one at level four, five, six, and even maybe seven will ever be that good. That's the definition. Um, the other definition, in a strong no hire, is if you would get Amazon into legal issues, um, then we strong hire, no hire. Um, yeah, so you're likely not going to see a strong hire, no hire. Um, by the definition, people do give them, but. Usually you're not by definition. Uh, yeah, I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I hope that that was some good context for him. Especially since, you know, people are, it's all about min-maxing, right? Trying to get the best result that you can on each interview. Um, but naturally, yeah. the understanding what that, that specific you know, quote unquote score means as good context as well. Yeah. We evaluate if you're 51% or better of the company or better than the team. Um, that's it. Uh, be better than half of the people already on the team. Makes sense. At that level. All right. I'm going to ask, let's see, one more question here from Raspberry Jackal here in the Dory. What's the best way to ask for hints or advice in the interview without seeming unprepared? Uh, I mean, sometimes you just don't know the question. And I don't care who you are. There's going to be a question that you just don't know or you're stuck on. Um, and the best example that I've ever come out of was the person who was like, look, I've gotten this far. I'm kind of stuck. Here's what I'm thinking, but it's not going to work here. What are your thoughts? Because you do that in real life. You, you understand how to ask a good question. You ask your mentor or you ask your team lead um, in a good way. Um, and they'll help you. And they'll give you hints on how to continue. It's the same thing with an interview. Ask a quality question on how to move forward, and we'll give it to you. Excellent. And just out of curiosity, Zach, um, in this particular uh, interview, how do you feel you did on on asking questions? Because I know that Kevin gave you feedback that you missed out on clarifying. But like in general, do you feel like this sort of aligns with how you've done this in the past, or was this just a nerves from this particular type of interview? Oh no, there's nerves every time. Uh, I definitely mess it up every time. Uh, it's I. I don't know. I, I think that I ask enough questions in the beginning. And then as I work through the problem, I, especially this time, I realize like I'm working through this problem that I don't exactly have a clear solution. And I think at that point, that's when you have to ask more questions. And I didn't do that this time. It helps if you have a structure, by the way, have a good structure to the interview and then follow it every time. Yeah. Excellent. I, I literally had someone when I was helping 
we got to a point where he would comment every part. He would say at the very top, ask clarifying questions. And then he would type out those questions and answers as I answered them. And then the next one under, he put, all right, let's talk edge cases. And then he would put underneath in comments what the edge cases are, what the expectations were. Um, then uh, the next one was, all right, how am I going to solve this? What What are the different solutions? What's the pros and cons? Which one am I going to go with? And then his code was well commented before we started. It's like, all right, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to do this. And then right underneath, he would type the actual code in. Worked out brilliantly for him. I like that. That's a, yeah, that's he a just, good method. Yeah, he just filled in the blanks. Almost like an outline. Yeah. So to all of you folks out there who could not stand their writing or composition or English classes, you know, this is for you. This, Kevin is telling you, use an outline. Yeah, I, right? I would love to see that. That is... That means you're overprepared, and that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, we are approaching the top of the second hour. Uh, naturally, you know, there will always be more questions. Uh, so what we will be doing, uh, likely through tomorrow, because it is getting late and it's still Thursday for uh, some of us here in the West, what we will be doing is we will be answering some of your questions in event questions. Uh, we'll lock the channel uh, as well as event chat. Uh, we'll, we'll answer follow-up questions, likely in threads, to make it a little easier to read. Um, so if you have some burning question, you have about two minutes before one of our trusty mods locks this thing down. Um, we'll also try to get to the Dory ones if possible. Um, but uh, if you want to be absolutely sure, you know, you can always try and cross post it to event questions, makes it easier on us. Um, with that being said, before we, uh, before I do my little wrap up speech, Kevin, Zach, do you have any closing comments or thoughts for anybody? Um, yeah, not for really anyone. I just want to say, Hey, thanks for doing this, Zach. And again, nice job on the LPs do better on the tech part. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity. This is an opportunity that doesn't come around a lot. Yeah, and, I mean, um, we hope to give more of those opportunities to help more people out. So we used to do it a lot more, and uh, it's hard to do, but um, it definitely seems to help when we do them. Absolutely. And so with that, what I am going to uh, do now is I'm going to make sure we plug a few things and do a little bit of house cleaning before y'all go. Uh, we will be doing some feedback. Uh, we'll be sending out a feedback link for folks to voice their dissent or their love for this event or their, you know, general meh attitude, depending on how you, you feel. But we'll be sending that link out. It's very brief, folks. It's really critical for us to help figure out scheduling for these. And... Uh, and really to determine what's the best way to go about uh, hosting these events for you. Because again, I know many of you showed up because we did here, <laughs> but um, if you would prefer to only be notified using uh, a really dedicated role, go to get roles under information, get event notifications added to your list, and we'll make sure that we get you the, the notifications as we're about to get started. Yeah, and then we, I mean, for the smaller things like office hours, we only ping notifications and uh, uh, things like that. But you will get uh, a here notification every so often. We don't do it very often like other, other servers might, but yeah. Absolutely. Um, well, if that annoys you, just disable here's. <laughs> exactly. Um, in addition to that, uh, like Kevin mentioned, we do office hours. Uh, we usually do uh, one to two a week. We are still currently in the phase of sort of locking down the best uh, rotation. Currently, I believe we have office hours scheduled for, I believe it's Mondays and Saturdays for one week. And then, correct me if it's, is that Tuesdays and Sundays? 
Um, but yeah, essentially the office hours are a way for you to do sort of like an AMA or like a Q&A with one of the moderators, uh, community managers, contributors, senior devs, junior devs, whoever is currently uh, in the field who, uh, who has either you know, already contributed software uh, in some capacity or has moved beyond it and is doing things like Kevin, like doing interviews, um, focusing on system design, uh, testing, you name it. There's a whole range of experience that we would love for you to take advantage of. So, so you can sign up for office hours as we send out the announcements. Um, they pop up in under events. I know it's a little janky, but we'll make sure to notify folks uh, every time that we are going to host them. So just grab that event notifications roll and you'll be notified. With that being said, we have crossed over the threshold. It is now 7 o'clock Pacific time, 10 o'clock Eastern time. And to all you folks who are trying to scramble to get your questions in, I'll give you a couple more minutes. Don't worry. Um, but with that, I want to say thank you again, Zach, for being a trooper. Thank you again, Kevin, for taking the time. Be on the lookout for future polls and announcements where we ask about getting your feedback, as well as uh, moments when we're going to be doing other events. So stay tuned. Thank you for listening. And have a good night.